keeping entitled with our Sabbath school, and you never can say enough about grace. Grace is, praise the Lord for grace. I'm going to start with the parable. It gives you an example of a changed life through grace. What is grace? Grace is a generous, free, and totally unexpected and undeserved gift. In 1963, I was 10 years old, and I lived in Boyle Heights. Now, if anybody knows where Boyle Heights is, it's a rough neighborhood in L.A., and it was a great place to grow up, but um, things happen. I was three blocks from the White Memorial Church, two blocks from the hospital, five blocks from the grade school that I went to. And it was fun. I had a lot of kids to grow up with because the area was big. There were a lot of kids. It was a diverse neighborhood, wonderful children to play with. The street I lived on was called New Jersey Street. It's the same street that the hospital is on, and I got to know that street well. I was in the emergency room many times. Some streets... Um, in that neighborhood were less desirable than others, and there was a rough neighborhood, but my mom was pretty, and dad was pretty watchful, and I, for the most part, was under, well, good supervision. I had a lot of good friends in that. I grew up with a lot of friends. Diverse neighborhood, all colors. I didn't see colors at all then. So I, I, uh, I was really blessed to be my best friend lived straight across the street. His name was Thomas Graham. He had two sisters, Talise and Vieta. They tried to teach this white boy to dance. I'm sure they got a lot of laughs out of that. There was Miles Kamuji, Gary Heyman, and Itchy Butt. Now, Itchy Butt grew up to be a proctologist, so <laughs> I just want you to know it's not just a funny name. He really became something of himself. So there's, and then there was me. There were five boys. And we called ourselves the Brooklyn Street Gangsters. Brooklyn Street's a main drag that went through L.A. and went over Boyle Heights, and we were n not allowed to play on that street, so we decided we'll call ourselves the Brooklyn Street Gangsters. One day, the five of us put all our money together, we gathered it up, Put it all together, and between five of us, we came up with 35 cents. And we went to Joe's tire shop, and we waited for Joe to go service someone. We snuck in the front room, and we put our money in the cigarette machine. Back then, a pack of cigarettes cost 35 cents. Pulled the handle, and out came a pack. Boy, we grabbed those cigarettes, and we ran. So we ran to a place that we called our fort or our hideout. It was a deserted garage. Um, it was a deserted garage owned by a gentleman who rented the places out to students who were going to the White Memorial. So the garage was not, didn't have anything in it, really. We went into this garage, and we, us boys, lit the cigarette, passed it around. And I think it was just that one cigarette that made us a little lightheaded. And we decided, man, it's cold in this garage. You know how cold it can get in L.A. I mean, after all, we're 200 feet above sea level. It got pretty cold. So we said, well, you know, let's start a little fire and warm our hands up, get warmed. So we gathered up a little newspaper, gathered up a little wood, went to the back of the garage corner, and we lit the fire and started warming our hands. The fire got a little bit bigger, a little bigger. Then it got up to some shelves that had had, in the past, old oil cans and paint cans on them, and poof, once that took off, it really lit up. Well, as 10-year-old boys, we did our very best to get the fire out, but we couldn't do it. So we did what most 10-year-old boys knew how to do good, and we ran like heck. <laughs> we opened the door, or <laughs> one ran, got out of there, Went home, I ran in the house. Hi, Mom, how you doing? Anything I can do to help? Can I wash, help dishes, vacuum, anything? She says, oh, man, you're home kind of early. You're usually out playing. Oh, no, I, I know, I just came to help you. About an hour went by, and there was a... I'll get it, Mom. I went to the door, 
There was the biggest man I'd ever seen in my life with the fire hat on. Must have been six, nine, and 400 pounds. He was huge, and he said, I'm looking for a little boy named Jimmy. And I said, well, let me go ask my mom. I don't, maybe I'll see if there's someone who lives here by that name. <laughs> and I go back, and my, right then my mom came, and he said, uh, I'd like to talk to your son in my truck. And I thought, ooh, that's good, because my mom told me never to get into a stranger's car. And she goes, you take him with you and have a good talk. There we went. I got in this guy's truck, and he didn't even ask me. This, uh, this fireman, he says, you know something, son? I can take your daddy's house. I can take your daddy's car. I can take your daddy, because you just burnt down a garage to the ground. We did our very, very best to save the house. And I go, I don't know what you're talking about. He goes, you know uh, what can happen to you? I can take you and keep you working for me to your old age of 21, washing cars, washing the trucks. And I just started crying. I'm so sorry. And he goes, I thought you said you didn't know anything about it. I'm sorry. Oh, please, please forgive me. I'm just don't know what I did. I don't know what I was thinking. It wasn't all my fault. He said, all right, son. If I ever see you again, you'll be the sorriest young man you ever can imagine. And he op reached over, opened the door, and let me out. Drove away. That, my friends, is grace. That's grace. And here's what I learned from that. As a little boy, I um, never smoked a cigarette since, one. Rarely played with matches, right, honey? and maybe 4th of July. And I changed right then from being the Brooklyn gangster to the Texas Ranger, and I rarely got in trouble with fire again. So there was consequences. But my friends, that is not really the grace I want to talk to you about today. The grace I want to talk to you, that's just an example. I want to talk to you about the spontaneous gift from God to us, his people. Let's pray. Father in heaven, holy is your name. I want to thank you for your amazing grace. The grace that sets us free. The grace that brings change. The grace that is what we did, don't deserve but is given to us anyway. Thank you for being our God and loving us. Amen. My thoughts and texts today are from the Bible, mostly, 90% from the Bible, and then I do have some help from Mark Finley, footnotes for you to know. A changed life. Why is it so hard for us, and I'll be saying us because I'm talking to myself too, why is it so hard for us to do what is right all the time? Without grace, we're helpless prisoners to sin. What does Jesus promise to those who follow him and surrender to his will? If anyone is in Christ, we are new creatures. Our scripture today said that. Jesus will give his people the desires to serve him and serve him only. He will take away our hearts of stone and give us a tender heart. Then we, be, we will want to obey his law and regulations. We will be his people and he will be our God. He will give us a heart to know him better. Jeremiah. This new heart is really a new appreciation of divine truth a stronger desire to follow Jesus and keep his commandments. How do we possibly accomplish this change? The Bible says, who can be clean? Who can be clean? Who can be made clean out of unclean? Job says, nobody. No one can be clean without grace, though you wash with lie 
and a lot of soap, you are still sinful before God. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Knowing this, who of us can be saved? With men, it is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Matthew 19. Those who are in the sinful flesh cannot please God. But, you know, cannot, but if you are in a sinless flesh, you are in the spirit of God and he will then dwell in you. What word describes what Jesus offers us? This is really good news. Let's turn together to Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. I'm going to be reading out of the New King James Version. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in him. Not by works, even of righteous works, which every one of us have done, but according to his mercy, he has saved us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift is eternal life in Jesus Christ. Jesus is still heaven's priceless gift. He is the God beyond compare that satisfies the longing of our soul and provides us eternal life, full and free, through his selfless sacrifice on the cross. What happens when we surrender our lives to Christ? Let's read together Galatians 2.20. This is real popular. It's uh, been turned into a song, and we probably, a lot of us know this by heart. Um, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loves me and gave himself for me. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with Christ, that the body of sin is done, we are no longer slaves, for we who did, for we who died has been freed from sin. Reckon yourself to be dead to the sin, but alive in Christ Jesus our Lord. All who believe in Jesus to them have the right to be God's children. God, who is rich in mercy because of his Great love, even when we sin, makes us alive together through grace with Jesus. Since you are alive with Christ, seek those things which are from above. Set your mind on all things above, not on earth. You realize that God not just purchased us, but he repurchased us that we no longer live our lives in sin, but live for the will of God. When an individual surrenders totally to God, the Holy Spirit takes possession of his life. The person becomes a new individual. By receiving Christ, a person receives power for victorious living. And day by day, as we abide in Christ, the Holy Spirit writes the principles of the law upon our hearts. What role does faith play in this salvation? Man is not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus. 
The law gives us the knowledge of what is sin. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Let's turn to Luke 18, 9 through 14. This parable, I'm sure we all know, it took on new meaning for me just recently going over this. I know you've all heard the story, but think about it as uh, Jesus looked at it back as he told the story. He, Jesus, Jesus speaking, Jesus spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves. Get that? Who did they trust in? Themselves. That they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, or basically prayed to himself, God, I thank you that I am not like this other man, an extortioner, unjust, an adulterer, or even as this tax collector over here. I fast twice a week, I give tithe of all I possess. Look at me. Next to him stood the tax collector, standing afar off with not much to say as he raised his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus says, I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbled himself will be exalted. For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not works. So let's walk hand in hand with Jesus. God has given us eternal life, this life in through and with Jesus Christ, he who loves the Son has life, 1 John 5. Most assuredly, Jesus says, he who hears my words and believes in God has eternal life. You will not be judged, but will have eternal life. Salvation is totally of grace, never of works by faith, we receive God's grace. Even when a born-again Christian obeys God, it is Christ who empowers him to obey. We only cooperate with Christ, and we let Christ work in us. Our responsibility is to be willing to do everything Christ asks us to do. Love is the motive for obedience. Christ will not ask us to do anything he will not provide us power to give. Thank you, Mark Finley. Since salvation is by faith, how can we receive Jesus' power to overcome sin and temptation? All who believe and accept Jesus have the right to become children of God. They are reborn. Do you hear what John said? He said, all who believe and accept Jesus have the right. The word right, John says, is you have the authority, you have the power. When we receive Jesus as our savior, he gives us both the right and the power to be his children. Then we're his children, so we also count ourselves to be dead to sin, but alive in God Jesus. If anyone is in Christ, we are new creatures. Old things passed away. All things have been new. <clears throat> For we are all sons of God. Through his faith in Jesus Christ. Through his son in Jesus Christ. Sorry. See how very much our Heavenly Father loves us. He allows us to be called children. And we really are his children. Through Jesus, we have the power to overcome sin. We no longer need to fail again and again, stuck in the rut of perpetual discouragement. 
Now we can be victorious. I'm so grateful that my friend Ray Sisko is with us today. I've asked him if he would read a text and share some thoughts with us. And then I'm going to turn a chair around for him. I don't know if he's going to come up here. To, or I'm going to just turn one around. And get... I'll let you do that while I'm... All right. But Tim, just come up on the platform. Good morning, saints. You are saints, you know. The Bible says so. My brother Jim has asked me to read from 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 through 13. And the scripture says, And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. What a precious thing that is, isn't it? And that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. I'm going to... Uh, let me get wired up. See if I'm uh, I'm on, aren't I? Thank you, Jim. I'm still dealing with uh, some uh, health issues. How many of you believe in the grace of God? I want to tell a couple of stories. Uh, my mother always used to say, "Ray, don't tell stories," and she wasn't talking about. Uncle Arthur's bedtime stories. How many remember Uncle Arthur's bedtime stories? I know the young people probably don't. Uh, I grew up with them. Uh, his name was Arthur Maxwell, Arthur S. Maxwell. Um, I heard Arthur Maxwell's son, Graham. Anybody know Graham Maxwell? Ever? Did you ever meet him? I met him in Loma Linda with my wife when we were there. And uh, he was teaching. He wasn't preaching at the time. Um, what a godly man he was. He passed in 2010, uh, but I was so impressed with him because he talked about being safe to save. And that's the first time I had ever heard that expression. God wants us to be safe to be saved. And that's really what it's all about, isn't it? God wants to know that we are willing to obey him. And if we are, then he will save us. Because that's what heaven requires. We need to be willing. Anyway, I'll tell you a couple of stories. I, um, I know we believe you just raised your hands when I asked who believed in God's grace. How many believe in cop's grace? We kind of talked about that in Sabbath school. A couple of people mentioned. I'll tell you a couple of quick stories about cop's grace. Um, I'll tell you the one story was, uh, I won't have, are there any police officers in the room? Oh, good. <laughs> um, I won't tell you the name of the road, but it was a very curvy one. I've been a motorcyclist ever since I was a child. And I was on one of my motorcycles. And uh, in front of me was um, a tiny little Datsun truck, pickup truck. Now, this was before Datsun became Nissan. I don't know if people remember that. It was originally called Datsun. And uh, the tiny little Datsun truck, it, about the size of a Chevy Spark, only with a little bed on the back. And um, I was behind him on my motorcycle. And the road was, oh, beautiful motorcycle road, you know, curves. And, and he was doing about 30 miles an hour. And I couldn't take that. So I dropped it into the second, next gear down and zipped around him. But it happened to be where there was a solid yellow line. And you know what those are about? That means don't pass. And so uh, then I heard a siren and lights behind me and I never saw him because he was parked back off in a dirt road. And so he pulled me over. I pulled over immediately, of course. And he came up to me and said, you know, you passed in a no passing zone. 
And I said, yes, I did. Yes, I did. You never lie to police. That's one of the rules of life. Never lie to a policeman. He was a federal cop, by the way. Uh, this happened to be in a national park, and I won't mention again exactly where it was. But anyway, um, I sat on my bike there for a while. He was checking out my driving record and everything, which, by the way, is a... I'm 72 years old, and I still have a perfect driving record. Thank you. Uh, so I went back to, the, to his car, and of course I had given him my license, insurance information, and I said, you know, sir, I said, there's the letter of the law, and there's the spirit of the law. And I said, the letter of the law says I should not pass, and I passed, and I was wrong. But I could see down the road very well, and I had a pretty fast motorcycle. And I knew that I could get around him quickly enough that I wouldn't pose any danger. And I said, isn't that the spirit of the law? <laughs> and this man, uh, he said, you know, I used to ride a motorcycle, a Norton, it's a British bike. And uh, he said, you know, I haven't put a name on this ticket yet. And he says, if you won't tell anybody, that I let you go, I will let you go without a ticket. Now that was cop's grace. And I said, thank you, sir, and I won't tell a soul. Of course, I'm going back on that now, but that's been probably 30 years ago. He's probably long retired or maybe even deceased, I don't know. But he's a very nice man, and I, I really appreciated that grace. The second time, that I received cop's grace. I was on a very, very fast motorcycle that I owned. It would do an honest 160 miles an hour. Don't ask me how I know that. <laughs> and uh, I was on, this was in Michigan, and I was on uh, Michigan 24, M24, going south. And it was a late afternoon, early evening, and I you know, this motorcycle was so fast, and, and I enjoyed the speed a lot. You know what that's about, don't you, Brother Jim? And uh, so I just kind of rolled the throttle on a little bit, and it went to 100 miles an hour, like that. And I said, well, that's enough, and I rolled it off, and then I saw the lights behind me. And so I pulled over, and he came up and said, you know, took my information, he said, you know, Mr. Sisko, I clocked you at just under 100 miles an hour. And uh, I said, yes, sir, I did crank it up a bit back there. And I probably shouldn't have done that. Just what I told him. So he also had checked my driving record, which, again, was a perfect driving record. And after a little bit, he came up and he said, uh, Mr. Sisko, uh, this road can be dangerous. There's deer out here. I didn't realize there were, this was not long after we had moved to Michigan, and I didn't realize that there were 30,000 deer accidents a year in Michigan. And he said, you need to be very careful and slow down. And I said, yes, sir, I will. I appreciate that. But, you know, I admitted my being wrong. You know, we need to do that with God, too, don't we? We need to have God's grace, but God wants us to admit when we're wrong. He wants us to repent. Let me tell you a little bit about God's grace, my experience with God's grace. Anybody ever felt the hands of an angel? I have. I was working as a freight clerk at the time in Jim Click Ford. I was a very young man in my 20s, and uh, I happened to be up on the trailer uh, unloading freight, helping the driver of the truck unload freight. That was part of my job. I was the freight clerk. And um, down below me were all kinds of automotive parts, sharp fenders and an engine block or two, and I was standing on the edge of that truck, the trailer, and I fell backwards. And an angel pushed me back up on that truck. And that's the truth. I felt it, and uh, I didn't know what, I was so stunned, because I had fallen. It wasn't just a matter of, oops, I lost my balance a little, I fell. 
and I was pushed back up on that truck. That's only one time that an angel saved me. It's the only time I ever felt physical force on my body from it. I know it was my guardian angel. Do you believe in guardian angels? They exist. They exist, and it doesn't take them long to be there. They're there instantly. Um, you know, God's grace is uh, amazing. Amazing grace. Grace, grace, God's grace. Help me out with this. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. Isn't that amazing? That's amazing. But you know something? Uh, we receive grace through the Holy Spirit. And God cannot extend fully his Holy Spirit to us when we are not united. And I want you to think about that. Acts 5.29 says, We ought to obey God rather than men. I don't care what your persuasion is politically. Don't put your faith in the news media. This is the truth. And he sanctifies us through his truth. So whether you're conservative or liberal or somewhere in between, which I consider myself kind of in between, uh, you know Jesus is both conservative and liberal. Did you know that? He's conservative in obeying his father. He's liberal in how he treats people. And we should be both. We should treat others as Jesus treated people, shouldn't we? Yeah. And you know something? Um, let me read a couple things to you. I won't take much longer. In the black church, they always said, take your time. Take your time. Husbands, love your wives. That sounds like a no-brainer, doesn't it? Jim, do you love Janelle? Absolutely. Why do you love Janelle, Jim? Mm. Not because of, not, you didn't marry her for her money, did you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Wayne, why do you love Cosette? Best thing that ever happened. I've got to agree with you. My wife, Karen, is the best thing that ever happened to my life. I just don't know what I'd do without her. David, why do you love Connie? Amen. Did you hear what he said? Probably the reason I'll be saved. Isn't that what you said, David? But it goes on, it says, husbands love your wives. You know, a lot of husbands don't love their wives. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. I want you to listen to this next verse. That he might sanctify and cleanse her, that is the church, with the washing of water by the word. You know, God wants to wash his church. Did you know that? We are not washed. Remember when the disciples were up in the upper room and Jesus was washing their feet and he said, ye are all clean, or ye are clean, but not all. There was one among them that was not clean. Now I make no judgment about who might not be clean, but I know that I'm not perfectly clean. We need to be clean, brothers and sisters. A pastor in Michigan uh, Pastor Vaughn there of the church that I attended, every email that he sent out had a message at the end that said, if we cannot be united in truth, we cannot be united at all. We need to believe truth, brothers and sisters. We don't need to believe what the internet tells us necessarily. Now, there's a lot of good on the internet, make no mistake, there is. But if we base our faith on that, we're in trouble. Uh, the world is full of lies. 
the devil sees to that. He loves to tell lies and try to make us believe them. But we need to base our faith on this. This is our only rule of faith, really, and how blessed we are to have it. He has shown you, O man, what is good. We know what's good, don't we? And what does the Lord require of you? Anybody know what book I'm reading from? Micah. Micah 6.8. I wrote a song about this, by the way. What does he require of you but to do justly? To love mercy, thank you. And to walk humbly with your God. We need to be humble. We need humility. And uh, humility is a difficult thing sometimes. It's a normal human tendency to want to exalt ourselves. As um, Jim was pointing out in the sermon, the, the publican that, uh, I'm sorry, the Pharisee rather, that you know, wanted people to see him and, and extol his goodness for you know, how he prayed. And, and then there was the, the publican, I believe, who put in all the money into the, into the till, into the plate, to be seen of men, the Bible says, to be seen of men. And then the widow put in her two mites. A mite, I believe, was about a tenth of a penny, roughly about a tenth of a penny. And uh, the Lord said she was blessed above the one who put in the, the greater amount of money. And I'm, we certainly can't base our faith on the amount of money that we put in. But God, uh, God looks at the heart, doesn't he? We as humans look on the outward appearance. And the outward appearance can be so deceiving. I had students when I, I taught for many years. Uh, I had students that, that looked pretty unusual. <laughs> I had some that were, you know, the spiked hair and some that were gothic looking and uh, almost kind of scary. And, but once I would draw them aside, and I often did, in my office and talk to them, I realized the goodness that was in them. Uh, please don't judge on appearance. You know, I, I'll finish up with telling you that I won't, I'll spare you the details of what I've been through physically, but I will tell you this, on at least two occasions, I almost passed. Yeah, I came very, very close, and it changed me. Uh, I'm different from what I was, and Karen will attest to that. I guess maybe that's what it took, because I took a lot for granted, including my relationship with God. Don't ever take your relationship with God for granted. Um, I had had the half of my right foot amputated and all the toes on my left foot amputated. And I contracted what's called osteomyelitis. Now, if you're, any, if you're a medical person, you know that that's infection of the bone. Uh, and that's very hard to cure. Um, I took, uh, you can still see the scar here where they put what's called a pick line in. Pick is a peripherally inserted central catheter. And they put it up over the shoulder and into the heart. And uh, they, over a 12 week period, uh, in my home, Karen and I, we administered antibiotics through that pick line to kill the infection in my bone. And then for two more weeks, wasn't it two more weeks, we did more antibiotics of a different type for a uh, flesh infection in my feet. And of course, antibiotics don't only kill the bad bacteria, they kill the good ones too. And so I contracted what's called Clostridium difficile, shortly known as C. diff. Um, difficile means difficult means that in Spanish as well. It's very difficult to cure. 
so I was hospitalized and more antibiotics. And in the hospital, hospitals are a bad place. Um, I have a dear friend in Michigan who is a respiratory therapist, and he said there are germs everywhere, everywhere in the hospital. And I contracted viral pneumonia. There, and I'm still suffering with it. I'm still dealing with it. That's been how many months now, Karen? <laughs> a couple of months dealing with. If you get pneumonia at all, don't get the viral brand. Get the bacterial brand, because it's curable. They can give you antibiotics for that. The viral, you just have to let it run its course. And uh, I couldn't breathe when I first came home. I spent 12 days in the hospital. And when I first came home, I could not make it to the bedroom. I slept on the couch when I could sleep. And it's been... Do you know what the name Israel means? He who struggles with God. That was the name given to Jacob after he struggled with God. And I struggled. I fought it. And I would lie in bed and just pray for hours. God, please heal me of this awful pneumonia. And at the same time, I was praying for my feet to be healed. I was in the wound care center at Canyon Vista Hospital a couple of weeks ago, and they said, your feet are healed. You talk about a blessing. It was a miracle. That was God. You know, of course, they are excellent. They're experts in treating wounds. And the last treatment was a actually a graft of placental tissue uh, that took and healed the, the wounds in my feet. And so, but they're still gathering more strength. That's why I have to be care walk carefully. But I realized during that time that I had, I mean, my wife has been so good to me. What a blessing. And, and let me tell you something else. The people in this church that helped us, I just want to thank you. What blessings you were. All of you, you know who you are that helped us, brought food and brought love and brought care and visited us. Uh, truly godly people. And I so thank you for that. Don't take anything for granted. You can lose your life in a heartbeat. And I just pray that we as a church are able to unify. God cannot bless us unless we're unified. We don't have to be all the same. You've heard the term unity and diversity. It's okay to be diverse. But we need to be unified in that. We need to have the same spirit, the same goals, which is to please God and to serve others. Yes, we want salvation. We do. But salvation is, well, it is a goal of ours. But really the goal is to serve God, isn't it? That's what Ecclesiastes says. That's the whole duty of man, isn't it? Man and woman. I always have to include woman. because Aren't women just as important as men are? Yes. <laughs> More so in a lot of cases. More so in a lot of cases. God knew what he was doing when he created man and woman. Husbands, love your wives. Love your wives. And I'll close with that. So you wanted to speak a little more, Jim? I hope I didn't take too much time. Not at all. I'm so glad Ray's back in church with us. Amen. Uh, and church, I am so pleased to see all these faces that I didn't know. I've not been in church for weeks and weeks and weeks, months. And of course, I well, two weeks ago I was here and sang, but that's the first time I had been here in months. And it's it's such a blessing to see all you folks. I, I want to get to know you. Uh, you 
a lot of you don't know who I am, never saw me before. So uh, let's get to know each other. Anyway, go Amen. ahead. Amen. God sent his only related by blood son into the world that we can live through him. How will we know when Christ dwells in us? The greatest evidence that Christ dwells in our hearts is the transformed life a converted born again Christian has become a new person. We will put off the old man of deeds and put on the new man who has the knowledge of him who created us. Knowing this, our old man was crucified with him. The body of sin might be done away with that we should no longer live slaves to sin. Jesus delights in giving us new power for living. As we con consciously choose to invite him in to become into our lives and be the Lord of our lives, his life-transforming power changes us. He lifts us from our human weaknesses and gives us his divine strength. No longer must we battle the desire of our own human nature alone. We are now conquerors through Jesus Christ. In Christ, we are free to be the people we were born to be. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how grateful we are for your grace. What would we do without it? I pray, Lord, that you sanctify us through your word. Your word is truth. Lord, please, please make us holy. Please fill us with your Holy Spirit. Lord, help us to be obedient. Help us, Lord, above all, to love you supremely with all our heart and our strength and our soul and our might. And help us to love one another as we love ourselves. You've commanded us to do that. And Lord, we take you up on that command. And the promises that you've given us in your word, Lord, we claim those just now. We claim salvation. You've promised that to us. Lord, we repent of our sins. Do we not, saints? We do. Heavenly Father, please forgive us our sins and our shortcomings. Please just help us to do your will and keep our eyes fixed upon Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And thank you again for your grace. Please bless us all in the name of Jesus. Amen.